thing, right? But the Creator set the biblical calendar. So before we go any further, we need to understand His reckoning of time. It is a lunar calendar beginning in the early spring and is based on the sightings of the new moon in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, each month. You had to sight the first sliver of the new moon. Two had to be two accredited witnesses who would then run up to the Temple Mount and they would holler up and say, we've seen the, the sliver of the moon. And so they would bring them up and the Sanhedrin would grill them as to what exactly did it look like, what direction was it going. And when they confirmed, yes, this was a legitimate sighting of the new moon, then they would declare it the, the new month. And this was especially important in the spring because that starts the whole biblical year. So when the new moon was sighted and if the barley in the fields, the spring barley, was harvestable within 10 days or 14 days because it had to be ready for the, um, the feast of Yom HaBikurim, of the, the first fruits. If it was harvestable and there was a sliver of the moon, then this is the first day of the year. If it was not harvestable, they would add another month and go to the next month. So some months for 13 months. All right. So each day on the Gregorian calendar that most of the world uses, which is based on sun worship, begins and ends at midnight. On the Creator's calendar, however, each day begins and ends at sunset, just as we are told in Genesis 1. Evening and morning the first day, evening and morning the second day, and so on. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days and let us bring the heart to wisdom. See, we named all the days, but Elohim numbers all the days of the week except for the Sabbath. That was the only day that had a name, even though that name came from the Hebrew word meaning the seventh, or Hashibi'i. Remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Jehovah your Elohim. So here we have a mini picture, always there's microcosms within macrocosms. The, the week is a prophetic picture of God's timetable. Six days for man to work, 6,000 years for man to work. The seventh is the day of rest. The seventh millennium is rest in his kingdom. You do not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. If he rested on it, as an example to us, what do you think we ought to be doing? Now in chapter 31 of Exodus, he repeats this command and states it even more emphatically. And Jehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, And you, speak to the children of Israel, saying, My Sabbaths. Oh, I thought these were Jewish Sabbaths. No, apparently not. My Sabbaths, he says. You are to guard by all means, not just if it's convenient. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations to know that I, Yehovah, am setting you apart. And you shall guard the Sabbath. He says it again. Guard it by all means. And then he repeats himself. You shall guard the Sabbath, for it is set apart to you. Now let's look at that word sign. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. That word sign is ot means a distinguishing mark, a signal, a beacon, a monument, evidence or proof. Oh, so the Sabbath is the evidence and proof that we're in covenant with him. He goes on to say, everyone who profanes it shall certainly be put to death. Uh-oh. For anyone who does work on it, that being shall be cut off from among his people. Six days work is done, and on the seventh is a Sabbath of rest set apart to Yehovah. Everyone doing work on the Sabbath day shall certainly be put to death. Yikes. And the children of Israel shall guard the Sabbath. So he says it a third time in this one passage. To perform the Sabbath throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. Now, everlasting means... It's everlasting. There is no end. Eternal. Eternal. So we still need to be doing that today. Uh, look, we're going to look some more at this, and then you decide. Between me and the children of Israel, remember, we're grafted into Israel, 
right? Between me and the children of Israel, it is a sign, this mark, evidence, and proof forever. Not just until Jesus comes. Forever. For in six days, Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So why is it that we think this is the only one of the Ten Commandments that we can ignore or change? When Jehovah said that our keeping of the Sabbath is the distinguishing mark, evidence, and proof forever that we are in covenant with the Elohim and creator of the universe. I'm just throwing this out there. Don't shoot the messenger. All right? I'm just... Go to him if you've got a problem with this. Now let's see what the scriptures say concerning the Sabbath. And remember, we are forbidden to change the scriptures. Proverbs 36, do not add to his words, lest he reprove you and you be found a liar. Do not add to the word which I command you, and do not take away from it, so as to guard the commands of Jehovah your Elohim, which I am commanding you. All the words that I am commanding you, guard to do it. Do not add to it, nor take away from it. And then... If you think, well, that's just Old Testament. Okay, in Revelation 22. For I am witness to everyone hearing the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, Elohim shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, Elohim shall take away his part from the book of life and out of the set-apart city which are written in this book. Ooh. So we must bear in mind that the Gentile church fathers, quote-unquote, of the third and fourth centuries took away from the Torah, forbidding what Jehovah had commanded from the beginning that we should observe forever. And they added pagan practices to the body of believers. But Jehovah is now restoring what was stolen from us. If we never hear the truth, we can't make the adjustment. Isaiah 58. And those from among you shall build up the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you would be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If, biggest little word in human language, if you do turn back your foot on the Sabbath from doing your own pleasure on my set-apart day, and shall call the Sabbath a delight, and the set-apart day of Jehovah worth honoring, and then... Honor it by not doing your usual things or pursuing your own interests or speaking about them. Then you shall find delight in Jehovah, and I shall cause you to ride on the heights of the earth and feed you with the inheritance of Jacob your father, for the mouth of Jehovah has spoken. Yeah. As we are told in Acts 3.21, Yeshua is being held in the heavenlies until the time of the restoration of all matters of which Elohim spoke through the mouth of all his set-apart prophets, including Moshe, since the world began. So, what about the Sabbath and the New Testament body of believers? Wasn't Yeshua raised on Easter Sunday morning at a sunrise service? <laughs> Didn't the early body of believers worship on Sundays? Didn't Paul preach on Sundays? Well, let's just see. Well, we're going to find out Yeshua kept the Sabbath. He did not observe all the man-made laws the rabbis added, but he kept the spirit or heart of the Sabbath as he had originally intended it to be according to Torah. Luke 4, 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and according to his practice, he went into the congregation on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Luke 4, 31, And he came down to Capernaum, that's Capernaum, a city of Galil, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths, plural. Luke 13, 10, and he was teaching in one of the congregations on the Sabbath. Mark 1, 21, and they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he went into the congregation and taught. Mark 6, 2, and Sabbath having come, he began to teach in the congregation, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did he get all this? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such miracles are done through his hands? Luke 13, 10, and he was teaching in one of the congregations on the Sabbath. Luke 6, 6, and it was also came to be on another Sabbath that he entered into the congregation and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was with him. Mark 2, 27, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Luke 6, 5, and he said to them, the son of Adam is master of the Sabbath. 
John 20, 19. When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, where the top ones met, this is after the resurrection, for fear of the Yehudim, the Jews, Yeshua came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you. Now he did this on the first day of the week. Let's look at that. This was Yom HaBikurim, the day of first fruits, which began when the weekly Sabbath that followed Passover or Pesach was ending at sunset. So as soon as the sun set on Saturday evening, that begins the first day of the week. Matthew 24, 20 to 21. And pray that your flight does not take place in the winter or on the Sabbath. Why, why would he warn us about that? Oh, that's passed away. What's the big deal if our flight takes place on a Sabbath? Because he's talking about the last times, by the way. This is his um, Olivet Discourse where he's telling them, they ask, well, what's going to be the sign of your coming? What's going to happen? And he starts telling them all the not-so-pleasant things that are going to happen. So pray your flight does not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there shall be great distress, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, and nor ever shall be. Obviously, Yeshua is prophesying here concerning our day, and the Sabbath is still a concern. Hmm. Well, the disciples kept the Sabbath. No. Yeah. Luke 23, 56, And having returned, they prepared spices and perfumes. This is the women coming to the tomb um, after his burial. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the command. Now, wouldn't you think they would be really interested in just going right to him and preparing his body and everything? But no, they honor the Sabbath. This includes his mother, by the way. Mark 16, 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Miriam from Magdala and Miriam, the mother of Yaakov, and Shlomo brought spices to go and anoint him. Rabbi Shaul and the body of believers in the book of Acts kept the Sabbath. Acts 13, 14 to 16. But passing through from Perge, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the congregation on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the Torah and the prophets, the rulers of the congregation sent to them, saying, Men, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, speak. And Shaul stood up. In verse 42 it says, And when the Yehudim, the Jews, went out of the congregation, the Gentiles begged to have these words spoken to them the next Sabbath. So even the Gentiles were observing the Sabbath. Verse 44, And on the next Sabbath, almost all the city came together to hear the word of Elohim. Acts 16, 13, And on the Sabbath day we went outside the city by a river where there used to be prayer. And having sat down, we were speaking to the women who met there. This was in Lydia's um, church fellowship, if you will. Acts 17, 2, And according to his practice, Shaul, Paul, went in unto them, and for three Sabbaths he was reasoning with them from the scriptures. Acts 18, 4, he was reasoning in the congregation every Sabbath and won over both Jews, Yehudim, and Greeks. So if the Torah made flesh, the son of Elohim, was going to do something as drastic as changing the eternal command concerning the worship day of his people from Sabbath to Sunday, the day the entire pagan world worshipped their sun gods, why did he not exemplify this change himself? Or even once mentioned to his disciples that this was going to happen so that they could make the shift themselves and teach the early body of believers to do so. Hmm. Remember, Exodus 31, 13 to 17, commands us to guard the Sabbath by all means, for it is a sign, a distinguishing mark, signal, beacon, monument, evidence, and proof forever between Yehovah and us. So how long is forever? When did forever end? It ended. It won't ever. That sign was given at Mount Sinai when the bride met with the bridegroom at her betrothal to him. Honor the Sabbath. That's in the ten. The Torah is the ketubah, the marriage covenant contract. The Sabbath is our engagement ring. It is the sign to the world that we have accepted his marriage proposal, and now we belong exclusively to him. Hmm. So the Moedim of Yehovah laid out as a prophetic roadmap of the journey of the bride. The Sabbath is the first of these Moedim, these set times, that is revealed in the Bible, kept by Jehovah himself from the beginning. 
Thus, learning to guard and keep the Sabbath is our first major step in this journey back to the ancient paths. But, you may say, Paul said we're not to let anyone judge us on the days we observe, the foods we eat, or the holidays we keep. Is that what he's really saying? We love to take scriptures out of context. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Can anyone diagram that sentence? What does this even mean? First, we need to understand why Paul wrote this letter. Colossae was known for the worship of various gods, including Artemis, Helios, Dionysus, Demos, Bule, Tyche, Isis, Serapis, and a local river god. The coins demonstrate typical Hellenistic religion, local Phrygian deities worshipped in the region, the Roman imperial cult, and Jewish mysticism. Boy, what a soup that was. Thus they were known for practicing polytheism, worshipping angels, the sun, moon, and stars, and living life according to typical Roman social and cultural norms. So this cultural mix blended the ideas of an eclectic pantheon of gods with their required appeasement and the unattainable hope of salvation, whereas the believers in Messiah brought a monotheistic idea of faith. Paul taught that Messiah has superiority over thrones, demons, and authorities to combat those false teachings in Colossae. So he wrote this letter to deal with a reported problem with false teachers who taught a syncretization of Christianity influenced by Greek philosophy. Syncretization means a blending, a hybridization of, you know, of theology into one mixed bag. So it was influenced by Greek philosophy, Jewish legalism and mysticism, and the paganistic Greco-Roman worship of gods. This was the Colossian heresy. So he wrote to the believers in Colossae to teach them how to settle and correct these problems and influences on the people in the congregation, challenging these false worldviews that had crept in. These new believers were being harassed by their families and friends for leaving their pagan culture and adhering to the commandments of Elohim, following his feasts and Sabbaths. So here is the literal translation from the Hebrew New Testament of that verse we just read in Colossians 2. Therefore, no one shall condemn you any more for food or drink or for a moed, a set appointed time, or a rosh kodesh, which is a new moon, or shabbat. For they are shadows of things destined to come, and they originate in Messiah, or the reality, their substance, is in Messiah. Huh. Don't let your friends, neighbors, countrymen, mom and dad, cousins, uncles and aunts, tell you, don't observe the Sabbath, that's not the way we do things here. You say, these things originated in Messiah. And these are pictures, shadows of things destined to come. Mm -hmm. In other words, don't take your cues from the world as to how you should conduct your spiritual life. The Moedim are shadows, prophecies of things to come that originate in Messiah himself. So don't let unbelievers tell you what to do. Don't let them judge you for your obedience to Elohim's commands. And don't let them pressure you into returning to observe their worldly eating and drinking habits or their pagan worship festivals and observances. In Romans 14, regarding not passing judgment on one another, Paul was settling disputes between Jewish and Gentile believers. The Sabbath is the minor issue here. Eating and dietary preferences are the main topic. You have to read everything in its context. And this has nothing to do with eating pork or shellfish. It's between eating meat or only vegetables, according to verse 2. Are you a vegetarian or are you a carnivore? Pork and shellfish and the like are not even considered food, biblically, but are called traif, meaning an abomination, never meant for human consumption. Their purpose is to be the garbage disposers of the earth so it does not become too toxic to support human life. That's why he said, don't eat those things, they make you sick. But with regard to verse 5 there in Romans, one indeed judges one day above another, and other judges every day alike, that each one be completely persuaded in his own mind. To some, only one day is important, 
to others, every day is holy to Yehovah. They are not arguing over Saturday versus Sunday. Paul's solution is to let people do as they feel comfortable in their own minds and allow them to grow and mature in their faith over time. We are to be sensitive to another's, another believer's current level of understanding and conviction and not force our own opinions on them, but live our faith before others in patience, gentleness, and humility, just as Messiah Yeshua, who is our example, has been patient and gentle with us. Now, there are only two New Testament references to the first day of the week after the resurrection. And a lot of times these two scriptures are offered as the proof of Sunday worship. 1 Corinthians 16, 1-2. And concerning the collections for the set-apart ones, you are to do as I gave orders to the assemblies of Galatia. Every first day of the week, let each one of you set aside, storing up whatever he has prospered, so that there are no collections when I come. Now, we, we have inherited this view of Sunday morning, pass the bucket. Right? That's not how offerings were done back then. They brought their tithes and offerings three times a year to Jerusalem during the major feasts of Pass or Unleavened Bread, uh, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. That's when they brought their tithes and offerings. Yes. Once a year, every family paid a one-half shekel of a temple tax for the maintenance of the building. That was it. They didn't take up collections on Sunday mornings or on Sabbaths. All right. So Paul is merely talking about the task of taking up the collection of food and supplies to send to the starving saints in Jerusalem. This has nothing to do with worship services. This task was work, and it would be a distraction from resting and focusing on Jehovah and the scriptures on the Sabbath, which was why he told them to do it on the first day of the week, which was a regular work day. The second one is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And on the first day of the week, the top ones, having gathered together to break bread, Shaul, intending to depart the next day, was reasoning with them and was extending the word till midnight. So this is the first day of the week. What does that mean? The sun had set on the Sabbath, and he continues teaching because they don't know when they're going to get to see him again. He doesn't know when he's going to get to see them again. So he's trying to instill in them everything he possibly can because they were hungry. They had merely gathered for a very traditional fellowship meal together after the Sabbath ended, called an oneg, as Jews typically do even today. Remember, by the sundown on Saturday, it was already the first day of the week, since Paul had to leave by the next morning, and that word in Greek is auge, meaning breaking of dawn, not the word that means the next 24-hour period called a day. He had to leave it at dawn. He continued to teach that Saturday night until midnight. So that's so that one. And there is one more verse that is misinterpreted and taken badly out of context. And that's Revelation 1, 9 to 10. I, John, who am, also, am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So this verse has all too often been used to prove that Elohim changed the day of worship from Shabbat to Sunday. But that is not at all what John is implying here. The scriptural phrase, the Lord's day, or more accurately, the day of Jehovah, has nothing to do with any day of the week. It is a Hebrew idiom that always and exclusively refers to the prophetic day of the judgment and recompense of the wicked at the end of the age, otherwise known as the great tribulation and the outpouring of Elohim's wrath. That is the entire subject of the revelation. And John plainly states that he was taken forward in time in the spirit, whether bodily or only in a vision, we don't know for sure, to the time of the end, so he could write about all the events he saw in order to prepare the believers who would experience these things firsthand. So the phrase, the day of Jehovah, is found no less than 27 times in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament always referring to the events of the same future time frame of judgment on the earth. And here are just a few examples. Isaiah 13, 6 and 9. Howl, for the day of Jehovah is near. It comes as a destruction from the Almighty. See, the day of Jehovah is coming, fierce with wrath and heat of displeasure, to lay the earth waste and destroy its sinners from it. So he's not saying, I was in the spirit on Sunday. 
Ezekiel 30, 2 and 3, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus said the Master Jehovah, Howl, woe to the day, for the day is near, even the day of Jehovah is near. It is a day of clouds, the time of the nations. Joel 1, 15, Alas for the day, for the day of Jehovah is near, and it comes as destruction from the Almighty. Amos 5, 18, Woe to you who are longing for the day of Jehovah. What does the day of Jehovah mean to you? <laughs> it is darkness and not light. Zephaniah, Zephaniah 1, 14 and 15. Near is the great day of Jehovah, near and hurrying greatly, the noise of the day of Jehovah. Let the mighty man then bitterly cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of distress and trouble a day of waste and ruin, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And that's what Sunday is. I don't want any part of it. But he's not talking about Sunday versus Saturday. He's talking about the events of the book of Revelation. So you get the idea. This is obviously not describing a Sabbath or a Sunday. So John was allowed to see the prophetic events that would unfold at the beginning of the 7,000 year day called the Day of Jehovah throughout Scripture. He's not talking about being in the Spirit on Sunday. We are all supposed to walk in the Spirit every day. Hello. If he had meant Sunday, he would have said, I was in the Spirit on the first day of the week. Because Jews didn't have a name for the first day of the week. Throughout Scripture, it's the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Hebrews 4.9. There remains a Sabbath-keeping, translated rest in King James, for the people of Elohim. Hmm. The Greek word used here is sabbatismos. This word refers specifically and only to the Sabbath and cannot be assigned any other meaning. All right. You got to look up what was being said in the original language because the translators didn't always translate accurately. A lot of them didn't have the cultural background and a lot of them were trying to prove their own theology. In fact, this is the one and only time this word sabbatismos is used in the entire New Testament. Every other mention of the word rest uses the words katapao or anapao, meaning to stop, cease, repose, as in a final abode. So, when he's talking about a sabbatismos, he means a Sabbath keeping. Yes, ma'am. Can you go back to the, to the previous slide? I think, I think there's been a lot of teaching, especially during the faith movement, where... Uh, we were taught that we could we caught we could keep the Sabbath by resting in Christ, and that is a great um, to, truth right there. Right. It's Sabbath Black keeping, not doing away with the Sabbath. It's Sabbath keeping right. as we rest in Christ. That's right. That just my lights went on. That's so good. Well, it remains then that Sabbatismos for us, that Sabbath keeping. Verse 11, let us do our utmost to enter into that rest. Lest, that this is the next verse after the one we just read. Let us then do our utmost to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. Why? Why is this important? Because not only are we imitating Jehovah himself, but the Sabbath is also a prophetic picture of the seventh or Sabbath millennium of rest. Do we really want to work another thousand years till the first day or the next millennium after the seventh day to rest in his kingdom? No. I don't think so. And guess what we will be doing in his millennial kingdom after the tribulation? Isaiah 66. For as the renewed heavens and the renewed earth that I shall make stand before me, declares Jehovah, so your seed and your name shall stand. And it shall be that from new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, not Sunday to Sunday, all flesh, all flesh, shall come to worship before me, declares Jehovah. Huh. So that's what we're going to be doing in the millennium. Now in the complete Jewish Bible, let's see how it's worded there. For just as the renewed heavens and the renewed earth that I am making will continue in my presence, says Adonai, so will your descendants and your name continue. Every month on Rosh Kodesh, which is the new moon, and every week on Shabbat, 
everyone living will come to worship in my presence, says Adonai. I think that's pretty clear. But are you absolutely sure the Sabbath isn't only for the Jews? <laughs> Isaiah 56, 1 to 7. Thus says Jehovah, guard right ruling and do righteousness, for near is my deliverance to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who becomes strong in it, guarding the Sabbath, lest he profane it, and guarding his hand from doing any evil. And let not the son of the foreigner, speaking of Gentiles, who has joined himself to Jehovah, speak, saying, Well, Jehovah has certainly separated me from his people, the Jews. Nor let the eunuch say, Look, I'm a dry tree. For thus says Jehovah, To the eunuchs who guard my Sabbaths, and have chosen what pleases me, and are holding on to my covenant, to them I shall give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I give them an everlasting name that is not cut off. And also the sons of the foreigner, the Gentiles, who join themselves to Jehovah to serve him and to love the name of Jehovah, to be his servants. All who guard the Sabbath and not profane it, and are holding on to my covenant, them I shall bring to my set-apart mountain, and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their ascending offerings and their slaughterings are accepted on my slaughter place, for my house is called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Did you catch that? So don't say, well, I'm cut off from the Jews, so it doesn't apply to me. He says, nah, I don't think so. To the sons of the foreigners, all who guard the Sabbath, he has these wonderful promises that we will come and be a part of his kingdom. Remember, Leviticus 24, 22 says, you are to have one Torah for the stranger, the Gentile, and for the native, the Hebrew, for I am Jehovah your old king. The renowned historian Bishop Eusebius records Constantine's edict concerning Sunday. Quote, all things whatsoever that was duty to do on the Sabbath these we have transformed to the Lord's day. Transferred. Uh-oh. This was done by man, not Jehovah, more than 300 years after the body of believers was established. And the Vatican has boasted many times over the centuries of their power and authority to change the laws of the Most High Elohim. Sunday must be enforced. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. This came out of the Catholic Record of London, September 1st, 1923. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's scary. Remember, six days are prophetically equal to 6,000 years. Each of our weeks is a mikra a little shadow picture of Elohim's prophetic plan that we rehearse. On the sixth day of each week, much work is done to prepare for the Sabbath, when no man can work. This is a picture of the final hours of daylight in this last day we are in, working to bring in the end times harvest before the Sabbath millennium of rest in his kingdom. So, should I make a big deal about insisting on a Sabbath service rather than a Sunday service? This is the question of the hour. Well, as it has been said, to make the question of Sabbath a cause for argument over whether we should have corporate worship service on Saturday or Sunday is usually unproductive and a deplorable reason for dividing into camps. Shabbat is not meant to be used as a source of strife, argument, and division in the body. On the other hand, most of our Sundays in church are anything but restful. Anyone agree with that? After spending a busy Saturday with shopping and errand running and projects and cleaning and cooking, we have little energy left to do anything but collapse in front of the TV. Then Sunday morning comes, and we're racing around trying to get everyone fed, dressed, and ready, and once we get to the church after fighting traffic, if we're in any sort of ministry, then the real work begins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then after church, we go home, prepare a meal, get changed into work clothes, and proceed to mow the lawn or wash the car. Everyone in the family is going different directions, and only if you're really fortunate does anyone even squeeze in a nap. So we begin and end every week exhausted. Does that sound like Elohim's highest and best for us? No. I don't think so. So how different 
might your Sunday worship services be if families in the congregation spent their Saturdays in devotional times at home or in fellowship with other believers? If parents or grandparents spent time around the dining room table on Saturday teaching their children the scriptures and everyone actually made time for physical rest? Do you suppose those families would come to church on Sunday more refreshed and better prepared to worship and honor the Lord? Just food for thought. Huh? Okay, so we still have a little bit of time, which is awesome, at least according to my clock. He's starting to 10, 10. All right. So let me, I just want to get started here a little bit. Am I okay to go for a little bit, a little bit further? All right. I have a question. Just me. If you don't mind. Certainly. So in the millennium, we're supposed to go to him on the Sabbath to worship. Is that right? Well, that's, I'm not sure how that's all going to work out. Okay. Because we will be kings and priests throughout the earth. I know for the feasts, we're going to be going up to Jerusalem. That's in Zeth Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14. We're going to be going up to Jerusalem for the feast from around the world. As far as going to Jerusalem, see, his, his presence is everywhere. And we are carriers of his presence. Now, Paul, he was all over the globe. He couldn't go to Jerusalem every Sabbath. You go to your local synagogue, your local place of gathering. I don't think we're going to be required to travel all the way to Jerusalem once a week for well, the all eternity. How do we get there? Is it like being transported? That, yes. that I mean, that's easy. possible. That's the of thought. Yeah. That's the of thought. And that is entirely possible. We don't really know. But that, see, there's a lot of things. We know in part. We see in part. We're going to know fully when we're with him, right? And he's going to reveal all these things to us. So we can't really speculate on things that is not real specifically laid out. Um, we just know that we need to practice now. We need to practice these things so that we will be ready when he comes. Yeah, that, doggone it, that, that veil that separates us from his dimension. Yeah, it's hard to walk through that unless he grants you the uh, ability to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's got to go beyond the rule. Yeah. It's got to go down to what was the concept behind the concept? it. And the concept was rest, spending time with him, being refilled, Absolutely. and not, not being a part of this rat race that the world system has, and we're all tired and exhausted and frayed because we just keep in the rat race, right. and we don't stop and just rest and get refilled. That's right, absolutely. So if you look at the example of Yeshua, he wasn't in Jerusalem every Shabbat. He was teaching in the synagogues all over the area where he was. So you could say, well, that's a, a, a picture. I, we really don't know. And uh, when we get there, it's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. to, but, you know, and... Since we all know only in part, and only see in part, each one of us sees a different facet right. of the whole. And there will come a day when we will see the whole thing, when he teaches us and straightens out all of our mess, messed up theology. Because <laughs> is there anyone here who has perfect understanding of all these things? No. I don't think so. I thought I did. <laughs> 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 it's like no. <laughs> I, I've got one. Um, that that was an interesting um, when you were talking about the offerings going uh, on the on the feast and the, and the Sabbath rest. Absolutely blows up religious church. Yeah. Blows it up with with yeah. just dynamite because we're, we're, it's like we're trapped in this religious system mm -hmm. and God's trying to get us out of it That's right. and set us free. You're right on the money there, brother. Absolutely. Set us See, free. It's interesting. The word religion, <coughs> the root of that, I speak Italian, so I understand Latin and, and Italian. You know that. Um, in Italian, it's religare. Religare means to bind up again. <gasps> legare means to, to tie up, to bind up. Mm. And re-legare means to do it again. So religion just takes you into a new form of bondage. bondage. Faith wow. and religion are two entirely different things. Mm. 
Religion is man's concept. That's right. Faith is his concept. That's right. And even the word faith, we don't really understand. In Hebrew, that word faith is emunah. It is not a mental exercise where, okay, I, I can agree with that concept, so yeah, I believe that. No, the word emunah means faithfulness. To be faithful to do, it's an action, it's a verb. If I'm faithful, then I will walk out my faith, following in his footsteps. I will do what he did. And we, even the word amen comes from that word. The root of it is emunah. And so when we say amen to something, we're saying that is a faithful saying. I agree with it, and I'm going to walk in it. Yeah. So, all right. So let's continue on our journey. We're going to go just a little bit into what was going to be next week. But... There's, there's so much to cover here when we talk about the feast. So, like we've already read that one before. So we started the journey of the bride with this uh, returning to the ancient paths and her Jewish Messiah by discussing the Sabbath, the very first of Yehovah's set-apart times, his Moedim. Okay, well we, we read all this, so I can, we were just, I was just trying to remind you after a week, but we're right there. So, we are about to step across the line into the prophetic seventh thousand year day, the Sabbath millennium, which will be kicked off by the tribulation and the long awaited wedding of the bridegroom and bride. But we must come into an understanding of what our bridegroom desires for his bride to do, how we are to conduct our lives and prepare ourselves before that happens. So, let's turn our attention to the Moedim that are commonly called the seven feasts of Yehovah. In reality, only three of them are actually feasts. Unleavened bread, Shavuot, and Sukkot. That Shavuot is Pentecost and Sukkot is Tabernacles. The others are remembrances that do not involve eating. In fact, some of them involve fasting. So the three main ones, unleavened bread or Chag HaMotzot, Shavuot and Sukkot were called Regalim. Regal is a foot, all right? So these are pilgrimage feasts where you had to actually make aliyah and walked up to Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate them together as a nation before Yehovah. The other Moedim were observed along with them without feasting necessarily. So, won't it be awesome the day when we all go up to Jerusalem? Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yehovah and Torah will go forth out of Zion and let him teach us his ways. That's going to be amazing. It is imperative that we understand the Moedim, the appointed times of Yehovah, for they lay out the journey of the bride from Genesis to Revelation. They are the key to understanding the prophetic timetable of Elohim's plan of redemption from the beginning to the end. You know, when a bride gets engaged, all her thoughts at that point are on preparing for the wedding, getting everything set, everything in order, picking out the most beautiful dress, the hairdresser, the makeup, the jewelry. I mean, she wants to look good for him, right? And so everything is is going towards, that's a goal that she is working toward, preparing herself. And this is where we are at. We're preparing ourselves. <sighs> so the four Moedim, uh, the spring Moedim, are all about Messiah Yeshua's first coming. And it's nearly impossible to understand the Gospels and Acts without knowing about these set times. They were initiated in Egypt mm -hmm. as the prophetic picture that Yeshua would fulfill as the Son of Man. The three fall Moedim are all about his second coming, and it's impossible to understand the book of Revelation without knowing about these set times. From the creation of Adam and Chava, or Eve, until the exodus from Egypt was a 2,500-year time of Elohim calling out, leading, instructing, chastening, and multiplying his bride until she became a nation. And then once that time of the bondage was fulfilled, then he raised up Moshe, the prophetic type of Messiah Yeshua, to be the deliverer of his people from their hard bondage. And so, the, the theme of Pesach, or Passover, is feasting for freedom. I like that little title on the book, We Were Slaves. Were, past tense. In the process of their deliverance, he instructed them in what would become the first three of four, the four spring Moedim of Yehovah, Pesach, or Passover, Chag HaMatzot, which is unleavened bread, and Yom HaBikurim, 
first fruits. The last of the four spring Moedim, Shavuot, or Pentecost, would be revealed 50 days later at Mount Sinai when the Torah was given to his people through Moshe. So after the giving of the Torah, known as the Ketubah, the marriage contract, his bride would disobey again and again and wander and stumble. And they, they, it's been a wilderness. Would you agree? Yes. It's, it's been a rough road for all of us and still is. It's taken great patience on his part, for she has never walked perfectly in all his ways. We've stumbled, rebelled, and suffered the consequences, and that pattern is still going on today. So the Moedim of Yehovah are laid out in the Torah as a prophetic road map of the journey of the bride as she returns to her Messiah. We can either be like men, don't ask for directions. They say if you know, men had just asked for directions, it would have taken 11 days to get to the promised land, not 40 years. <laughs> I don't think it was just the men's fault. But anyway, we can either say, well, I'll find my way, or we can actually look at his roadmap and stay on course. It's his spiritual GPS, if you will. But you may say, those are Jewish feasts. They don't apply to us as Christians. Well, let's see what the creator of the universe has to say about that. Leviticus 23.2. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them. Now remember, this was a mixed multitude that came out with them. They weren't just Hebrews. Wasn't just members of the twelve tribes. There was a mixed multiple. In fact, it is said that there were more non-Hebrews than Hebrews who came out in the Exodus, because the Egyptian Empire had conquered many different peoples and many different lands. They didn't go specifically after the Jews. In fact, the Jews lived there great under Joseph. They had you know good status, but then there rose another Pharaoh who didn't know that Pharaoh, and things went downhill from there and they conquered a lot of other people, and of course they all became slaves. So, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, concerning the Moedim, or the set times of Jehovah, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my Moedim. He never calls them Jewish feasts. He consistently calls them his feasts, his divine appointments, his set-apart times. Leviticus 23, 4 to 6. These are the Moedim of Yehovah, not of the Jews. Set apart gatherings which you are to proclaim at their appointed times. In the first new moon, on the 14th day of the new moon, between the evenings, is the Pesach, or Passover, to Yehovah. And on the 15th day of this new moon is the festival of Matzot, to Yehovah, or unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. It's called the bread of our affliction for a reason. If any of you have ever eaten matzah, it's, well, you could melt it down and hang wallpaper with it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the next several verses go on to describe the Moedim of first fruits, Shavuot, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, which are to be observed to Yehovah. He then sums it all up by declaring in verse 37, These are the appointed times of Yehovah, which you proclaim as set-apart gatherings. So in describing the duties of the millennial Levitical priesthood of Zadok, which means righteousness, Elohim says this in Ezekiel 44. They are to teach my people the difference between the set-apart and the profane, and make them know what is unclean and clean. And they are to guard my Torah and my laws in all my Moedim and set apart my Sabbaths. They belong to him. And remember, in the millennium, well, there are going to be millions of people around the world who survived the tribulation and come into the kingdom who are not saved. Guess who's going to be teaching them? We are. we are. We'll be kings and priests. We will be teaching them the difference between the set apart and the profane, between the unclean and the clean, and we will teach them his ways. It'd be nice if we knew those ways ourselves before trying to teach others. <laughs> so now we have determined that these are not Jewish festivals, but we decided that they are the Moedim of Yehovah himself. So let's look at each one individually, starting with the first one, Pesach. Jeremiah 10, verse 2, do not learn the way of the heathen. Unfortunately, during the Babylonian captivity, the Israelites did learn their ways, and so have we. 
Deuteronomy 12, 30 and 31 says, Guard yourselves that you do not learn the way of the heathen, and that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, Hmm, how did these nations serve their gods? And let me do so too. No, do not do as they do unto Jehovah your Elohim. For every abomination, and that word abomination in Hebrew is a very strong word, it's tovah, meaning utterly detestable, repugnant, putrid, vile, and sickening thing, which Jehovah hates, they have done to their gods. Yeah, so don't learn, don't learn their ways. Jeremiah 16, 19, Oh, Jehovah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge, in the day of distress, the nations shall come to you. Oh, are we in the day of distress? Would you say that? Yeah. yeah. So come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there's no value in them. We've inherited a lot of falsehood and a lot of lies and a lot of futile doctrines also. And it's time to straighten things out and get back to the word, not man's opinions. Most of our traditions, customs, and so-called holidays that we have inherited come from ancient Mesopotamian pagan fertility rites and rituals of idolatry that were sanctified by the sun-worshipping Roman emperors from the time of Constantine more than 1800 years ago. These holidays have absolutely nothing to do with Yeshua or the Bible, and they were never authorized or sanctified by the Creator. Catholic Cardinal John Henry Newman, in his book, The Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine, states in chapter 8, The rulers of the church from early times were prepared, should the occasion arise, to imitate or to sanctify the existing rites and customs of the population, as well as the philosophy of the educated class. The use of temples and those dedicated to particular saints and ornamented on occasion with branches of trees, wreaths, incense, lamps, candles, votive offerings on recovering from illness, holy water, holy days and seasons, use of calendars, processions, sacerdotal vestments, the ring and marriage, chants, are all of pagan origin and sanctified by adoption into the church. Oy vey. <laughs> hmm. I mean, they just blatantly say it. Constantine's Nicene Council, 325 Common Era in Nicaea, Turkey, actually it's Nicaea in Turkey, outlawed the Creator's calendar and observance of the biblical feasts and officially sanctioned the observance of Easter, Christmas, and the timekeeping associated with sun worship. Part of the text reads, All the brethren in the East who have hitherto followed the Jewish practice will henceforth observe the customs of the Romans. It also reads, We ought not therefore to have anything in common with the Jews, for the Savior has shown us another way. We desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews. Thus the root of anti-Semitism became firmly entrenched in the church system from this point on. Now the Laodicean Council, that was under Emperor, Emperor Jovian in 363, they think, there's a disputing over the exact days, also took place in Turkey. It outlawed the Sabbath, and decreed Sunday worship for all believers, whether Jewish or Gentile. It also forbade fasting, feasting, or eating unleavened bread with Jews. The death penalty was imposed for breaking these new man-made laws intended by Hasatan, the adversary, to supersede and nullify the law or the Torah of Elohim. Here are just a couple of its edicts. Canon 29. Christians shall not Judaize by resting on the Jewish Saturday, but they must work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor, and as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be anathema from Christ. Mm. Or Canon 37. No one shall accept festal presents from Jews and heretics or keep the festivals with them. So none of the feasts of the Lord, uh-uh, can't do that. Under penalty of death, they outlawed circumcision, they outlawed Torah study, they outlawed the Hebrew language, everything associated with the Jews and the God of the Bible was outlawed under penalty of death. Wow. Yeah, that's a scary thing. And they took the things that they wanted to 
they took their pagan customs and they candy coated them with gospel stories. Because, see, Constantine had a little bit of a problem on his hands in his empire. He had all these pagans that had always been part of it, and now we've got this rapidly growing sect of messianic believers. What are we going to do? The, the empire was on the verge of a civil war. And so he says, I know. I will create the first man-made, worldwide, government-authorized religion. And so he took all of the festival dates and the trappings and the decorations and everything and said, well, now we're going to do these as unto Jesus. What did we just read? Don't learn the way of the heathen and say, you're doing these as unto Yehovah, because they're vile, they're detestable, they're toed ba, they're an abomination to me. They make him sick to his stomach. And yet, this is what we inherited. 2 Corinthians 6. Do not become unevenly yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness or Torahlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? And what agreement has Messiah with Belial? Or what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? And what union has the dwelling place of Elohim, which we are, with idols? For you are a dwelling place of the living Elohim, as Elohim has said. I shall dwell in them and walk among them, and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Jehovah, and do not touch what is unclean, and I shall receive you, and I shall be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says Jehovah the Almighty. Amen. So, we know what he does not want us to do, and I'm not going to focus on all that stuff. But what does he want us to do? He has given us clear instructions in his word from the beginning to the end. But as it is written, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. So we're going to try to remedy that. It's time for us to repent, to return to him and learn of his ways and obey his eternal commandments. For he will not be unequally yoked to a disobedient bride. Amen. Celebrating the feast does not justify us. Let's make that clear. We are justified by faith in the shed blood of Yeshua Messiah alone. But celebrating the feast does instruct us concerning Yehovah's plan of redemption and his prophetic timetable. Besides the fact, he loves for us to feast with him. I, I hate to... It's like he, he loves a party. He loves a festival. And he wants his people to come to him when he actually invites us and sets the table for us. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to stand him up when he's proclaimed, you know, he's asked us out on a date and we stand him up. That's not good. So the Apostle John set out to prove Yeshua was Messiah by showing how he fulfilled the spring feasts of Yehovah. The Gospel of John cannot be understood fully by a Western mentality without knowledge of the feasts. Later in life, John wrote the Revelation detailing how Yeshua will fulfill the fall feasts. In Deuteronomy 16, Elohim instructs us that these feasts are for both Jew and non-Jew, and that we are to celebrate them together. The word translated in these verses as stranger is the Hebrew word ger, meaning a believing Gentile who has joined himself to Yehovah, like Ruth. She adopted the ways of the, the, the Jews. She didn't expect them to adopt her pagan ways. And she's in the lineage of Messiah Amen. because of her obedience. So this ger means a believing Gentile who has joined himself to Jehovah. It's important to understand that all the feasts taken together reveal the complete plan of redemption. However, each individual festival centers on a particular theme or part of that plan. So I'm going to quit here. And next week, we're going to start with Passover. Oh my, buckle your seatbelts, because there is so much in there that it, you're just, your your brain is going to be exploding, all right? And that's a good thing. What are we going to start with? Passover. 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 Yeah. I'm hearing it. Pas Passover. We're going to start Passover. with Passover next week, yeah. And I'm pretty sure you're going to hear it like you've never heard it before. So. Amen. Very good.